Welcome. How's everybody doing? Good. We got a huge crowd. You can't get you can't sit in the back if you don't show up early. That's all right. Well, good. Well, I'm excited to be here. Um, this is the cow calf uh, track. We've got a feed yard track, and we've got some swine and dairy tracks here as well. Um, my name is Brian Dorsey. I'll kind of get through that here in a little bit. I work for. Um, Southwest Veterinary Services. We are the consulting group for Farmers Business Network. And so we are a group of veterinarians do primarily consulting work across the United States. And so as we went around and queried the group about topics that we thought were timely and important um, that we find ourselves talking about on a daily basis, this is the one that I find in my area that I run that comes up frequently. And there are things that we're going to talk about today that you all can think about on your own operations on how you would address these or if they may or may not be an issue. So super small group. Um, I was a little scared when I saw the chairs, so I'm, I'm way more relaxed now. Um, but as, as we get questions, raise a hand. We'll leave some time at the end for questions, but if you've got a burning question as we go through this, I'm happy to answer it. Um, most of this conversation is had over the hood of an F-150 pickup with a vet box in the back. So not only are we doing local practice, but we're also um, doing consulting work at a distance. So with that, we'll get started. Um, disclosure, disclaimer, I've never had to have a talk with one of these before, but um, just the average legal mumbo jumbo. But again, um, my name is Brian Dorsey. I grew up on a diversified cow-calf operation about an hour and a half north of here. Um, our family still runs cows on that operation right now. My uncle finishes some cattle, and so my, I currently reside in Worthington, Minnesota, which is in the southwest corner of Minnesota. And my plan was to go to South, I went to South Dakota State for undergrad and then Iowa State for veterinary school. My plan was to go to Minnesota and leave all my screw-ups in somebody else's backyard and then move back to Nebraska and do cow-calf practice was, was my original plan. But when I got to Worthington, it was a, a great place to live and raise a family and a great forward-thinking group of veterinarians and that's who's part of our Southwest Vet Service Group today. So um, I do primarily beef work, so consulting anything from a 500 head yard to a 25, 40,000 head yard is not out of the realm of my weekly work, as well as working with uh, cow-calf operations from Montana to Michigan, essentially from five to several thousand heads. So there's no right or wrong answer to what's going on um, in, in everybody's operation. It's just different. And so Hopefully, as we go through these topics today, I stimulate something that gets you guys to think about what, what can be done, what you think you do right, and what you think can be improved on on your own operations. So as I think about the top five things that I see calves come to a feed yard or leave a ranch with, they, they kind of distill down into these, um, these kind of categories here. So I think we have a, a hard time recognizing stress and then identifying the levers or the buttons that we can use to, to affect that stress in our cows, our cow-calf herd, as well as our feed yard calves. So especially as we get personnel that may or may not have a, back, a ranch background or, or a cattle background. And I'm seeing that more frequently in the feed yards that I consult with, that we've got a, an, an, a labor situation that is in need of a lot of training. But the nice part is there, there's a number of folks that are super receptive to new ways of thinking. I think we do a, a fair job of managing parasites, but I, I see a lot of operations where that can be improved um, through planned uh, conversations with the nutritionist and or the veterinarian. And taking the time to discuss new and upcoming compounds that may be part of our, our protocol. Managing nutrition, um, both if we're, if we're a cow-calf operation and we're doing some backgrounding, um, there are some areas of the country that are getting into backgrounding more so than they have in the past as these new corn varieties actually make them really well suited to, to be planted in other parts of the country. So I find myself talking a lot about uh, managing nutrition in, a backgrounding oper in backgrounding operations. And then biosecurity, biocontainment. I think we think that we get, you know, it's, it's interesting because you'll get a, a group of ranchers that there's three brothers and they've got 
but they're all kind of, they think they're one man's cattle, but they're three brothers and feed up into dad's operation. And, and really they're three different herds. And so how we think about biosecurity, biocontainment, and how that flows into the pathogens that we're either going to put in our backgrounding lot or we're going to use um, as we develop our heifers uh, plays a part in it. And one of the things about our practice in Worthington, there's a lot, of, we're, our notoriety when I came there 20 years ago was for swine practice. And those guys, the swine folks are the ones that have really perfected the biosecurity, biocontainment mentality as we talk about all the pig diseases that travel around the country. And so as I came there, I stole a little bit of that mentality and it's really paid dividends for both the ranches and the, the feed yards that I work with. And then finally, managing health and immunity. I think we, we think about that differently, but actually it's kind of health and immunity are a result of managing these other things correctly. So with that, I'll jump into to managing stress. And I, you know, when does stress start on a ranch? I mean, you could go all the way back to birth and calving for any, anybody here from North Dakota? Yeah, how was your winter? Yeah, about as bad as I thought, you know. When does stress, stress begin on a ranch? And, and, and really that could be at any phase and it carries through the life of that entire, or that calf. And so lots of times we talk about stress or you hear veterinarians talk about stress, it's stress begins at weaning and, and that's not necessarily always the case. And so um, it's been interesting as, as I've gotten to different parts of the country, the, the gathering process on some of these calves, they're, they're already stale by the time they get to the cell barn because we're trailing them for two days and then we spend two days. I've been shocked in some of the, some of the, uh, the weaning processes that I've been part of because all of a sudden, you know, when you've got a pasture that you've got to, you've got to trail these cows for five miles before you can get to a, a, a corral where we can get them, get them split, um, it's a lot of stress by the time they get there. A lot of the shrunk uh, the shrink is already out of them by the time they get there. And so when I see them coming at me at the feed yard as a veterinarian, I go, man, these things are just not reading the book, right? These are ranch fresh, low stress, double vac calves, but they were gathered for five miles, you know, loaded on a truck and sorted a couple different times. And so then I find myself working through that process with a lot of my feeders. And we even saw it this year when we um, split our calves at home off our cows. Um, real dusty day, real, um, we, had, we had taken in some help, some of the neighbor uh, kids had come over and wanted to help and they were not cattlemen, so, um, and then they needed some training and, and my brother and I are, are, are trying to impress on those young men that, that stress, their behavior directly impacts the stress that's going to pay off or or hinder the health of these calves as we put them in the backgrounding lot. So um, when does it begin? At any time, but we try to manage it as best we can. Some of the strategies that I've worked with with a lot of my ranchers are, are fence line weaning, um, if that's available. I get that not everybody has that, but I've been very pleased with the, the getting the ball out of those calves. If you've got containment facilities tight enough, to, um, to make that happen between the cows and the calves. And the fence line weaning forces them to introduce them to feed, right, of what we want to kind of start on our backgrounding um, phase. Allows them to feel sorry for themselves a little bit. And, and mama can still see and smell and touch them. And by three or four days into this, um, it's interesting to watch how that pair just naturally pairs off. Bags are tight, and then we kind of go on about our business. So I think, I think the fence line weaning has been one of the tools that I, in the ranches that I consult for, has been very exciting to see in health benefits as well as nutritional benefits as we get those calves started up on feeds. So as you're thinking, as you're in the, thinking about the possibility of a fence line weaning program, um, sometimes it's just setting up a pen somewhere close to your, your uh, corral facilities with some sucker rod that, that makes a difference. Getting through the cattle often, I find this to be um, very telling when we go to gather calves. And so uh, you can, 
I can take ranches that they do all the work with a side-by-side -side and a four-wheeler and the neighbors come over to help and they're a horseback and the cows don't know what these horses are or they're a horseback type, type operation or a pickup. Maybe you're out checking cows with a pickup. As we change that means of interaction or that tool that we use to interact with our cattle, um, it dramatically changes the changes the behavior on weaning day when we go to, to split those pairs. And so if you're a horse guy or if you're a horse ranch and some guy shows up on a, with a dirt bike, that's usually when all hell breaks loose and, and something goes bad. So getting through the cattle often with whatever means of interaction you guys have on your ranches um, is very important. And slow and steady, that's the other one. What I find is not everybody can identify that flight zone on an animal. I find, especially in my own young kids, te having to teach them the appropriate amount of pressure to put on an animal. And I find it in myself as a very busy manager as well. When I'm busy, I don't think about that. And the rule of thumb that we try to implement with our cows is we don't ever want a cow to break a to break into a run. Now, we all got some of those snorty rips that will break you into a run, even when you don't want to, and we get that. But teaching our people to, to go slow and steady through these animals has been a very helpful uh, tool as I go out and interact with people. So I'll throw this story out there. The best feedlot manager I ever have dealt with used to manage a Taco John's three weeks before he came to the feed yard. And so I'm going to ask a question to the audience, why would that be important? Or why, what, what would that interaction, why would, he, why would that make him a good feedlot manager? Guesses, come on, a couple. Manage people, that's one, that's a good one. What else? Bingo. Grant, you've heard me tell this before, haven't you? <laughs> Um, he had no preconceived ideas. I've heard guesses of he can speak Spanish, and I've heard guesses of he works with the product, right, because he's making tacos. But that young man had no bad habits. And so everything I taught him and the nutritionist taught him, he soaked up like a sponge. And one of the best things that I taught him was how to put pressure on cattle. Because as managers, as young people, we get busy and we want to, we think that we're way over pressuring these cattle. And so that makes a big difference how we're splitting pairs when we're going on weaning day of what our pressure looks like. And Tom Knopfsinger, Temple Grandin, they've all validated the health and performance attributes of slow and steady, low stress cattle handling that I think we, we do a good job in ag of telling people how to do things, but we don't do a good job of telling people why we do things. And so we had some, a few choice words with a couple of our, our neighbor kids that were helping us, some in the heat of the moment, some afterwards, but, um, but that slow and steady pressure is a, is a big deal. And then gather on the best weather days. You know, we really... Um, look at the weather on, on when we can gather and when we've got help. Those two things. Dust was a big issue for us this year in the northeast corner of Nebraska. And gathering in the dust, is there's nothing worse. And a funny story is we're getting shirts that say, please forgive me for what I said when we were sorting cattle because of, because of splitting pairs this year. So how do we manage stress at the sale barn? You know, that's the next stage as we work through the stages of a calf's life. What can we do? You know, oftentimes um, we as ranchers, we can pick sale barns, right? And so depending, and some of those are picked for us based on our relationships. But I know there's, there's a, a, two sale barns in a location where I do a fair amount of work that there's sale barn A and sale barn B. And sale barn A calves get along really, really well. Sold from, and same ranches go through the same different sale barns each year. So they may go to A one year and B the next year. Sale barn B, we end up clipping about somewhere between 5% of their toes for toe abscesses. 
And so if I have a choice as a rancher and I've worked my butt off to get these calves to a prime value and I don't realize that sale barn B, we have a fair number of lame cattle that come out of that because of either poor design or poor staff instruction. I, I, I re my feeders that are my customer as a rancher have a different perception of my cattle as they go through sale barn B versus sale barn A. And so there are times to, to get some feedback from whoever buys your calves or as a, as a cattle feeder, keep track of source um, so that we can, we can help manage some of the stress at the sale barn. Because clipping toes for toe abscesses uh, it is nobody's favorite job. So the other, as we're developing relationships with sale barns, make sure we know the calves that are come th coming through there as well. Um, understand the flow of cattle for the week at the barn. It's interesting, we did some sale barn work in Northwest Iowa as a practice. How many, is some, how many of some of these calves are, are dropped off a day or two early? Because that's when it works for, for the guy to, to get, them, get a trailer rounded up and dropped off. And so you take those 10 head and scatter them across two pots of these stale cattle that are already incubating a disease. All of a sudden your ranch fresh calves break with something when they get to the feed yard. It has nothing to do with what you're doing. And you get a call from the cattle feeder says, ah, these, these didn't work. Well, there's all these things of understanding flow of the sale barn um, that, uh, that play a big impact in health, the health of our cattle. Have transportation lined up ahead of time. That's not always easy um, when there's a buy. And I've been on both sides of that. Um, so sometimes these cattle will stand overnight in a, in a sale barn. Um, and be exposed to pathogens in the water and in the environment that they normally wouldn't have, especially with some of the, uh, some of the more remote, very isolated uh, sources or ranches that we work with. A lot of times their first exposure to any, any bug other than what mama would be carrying is at that sail barn. And so the faster we can get them through there, the faster we can get them out. And then limit the number of sources. I always say that there's five head on the on the end of every load that we should, shouldn't even take in the feed yard because we put together a load of really nice ranch direct cattle and then our order buyer tries to make a little extra money and he buys five or 10 head that he adds onto the order and then they show up at the feed yard. We've done a really good job as ranchers to get our vaccination protocol done, our, our, our uh, nutrition right, and then we add these five head in there. And so it's, it's an interesting, uh, interesting dynamic that I, I see a lot of hard work uh, kind of thrown down the drain from that. Uh, managing stress on the truck. Be reasonable with the number of head. I under, fully understand and appreciate the impact of freight on our business, both in feedstuffs and, and, and animals. Um, but Dr. Nagorski, who's next door talking, and I have been um, tracking the the number of head sent on some of these uh, trucks. And we found a threshold on some of these, these cattle that um, we get a fair amount of dairy cross animals coming from the Amish. And I'll just tell you that head count makes a difference on the truck. And it, does, it shows up in morbidity and mortality at about 60 days on feed. And so um, I know as we're, as we're freighting heifers into our ranches or, or freighting calves out, uh, freight's a big cost. But but some of the long-lasting impacts that that can have um, can, can be detrimental. Develop a relationship with a trucker ahead of time. I've, and I said, ask around, gear jammers versus livestock transportation specialists. We, we have a lot of gear jammers in this business. We don't have a lot of livestock transportation specialists. So the, the, and it's an interesting uh, dynamic that I'd never tracked until I was talking to uh, a feeder that uses two different uh, trucking services to, to haul to the packer. And he sees a 1% decrease shrink in the cattle that are hauled by one service versus the other um, in, in his trucking services. So one's a family owned operation with very little turnover. The other's a, a gear jammer type of a deal with lots of turnover and lots of, lots of jockeys that go down the road. So stress on the truck makes a difference. How do we manage stress at the feedlot? Well, hay and water on arrival is key. We, we, we try to get those cattle filled up, get the rumen in a good, good spot. 
And my rule of thumb is for every hour that they're on the truck, I want them to rest a minimum of two hours. And that gives their system enough to recuperate some of that dehydration that they experience in transit. It gives them some time to look around the pen and see what, where they may, may stack up in the pecking order. And it also, um, as they get that dehydration back, their blood volume expands. So our vaccines work better. Our met metaphylaxis antibiotics that we may or may not use work way better. And so getting that shrink back as fast as possible is key. And let them rest. Pen them in the home pen ASAP. My rule of thumb is get a pen built by, by day seven. Don't, and you know, we get, a, we get some backgrounders or some guys that are starting to background and they'll, they'll get their calves background, get them going background and then they'll maybe buy the neighbors to add to them. I don't ever want to do that after seven to 10 days because after that we get this whole we're kind of on a hamster wheel of disease after that. And so get a pen built and closed by, by, by 10 days on feed. Start calves in a quiet part of the yard. And this, I, this is not something that was super intuitive for me to see until I was driving a yard and these calves would just, they were just wrung out and tired. And you could tell that their heads, every little twitch, you know, they were probably in somewhere in remote, Wyoming or, or Western South Dakota, never heard, you know, a corn mill going all night long or, or listened to a feed truck go. And so it's, it was interesting as we moved the starting part of the yard, because everybody likes to bring them up close, right? Because then everybody's driving by them all day. Well, there's a certain number of these calves that are just always on all the time because there's so much activity that they're not used to. And so when they're that always on fight or flight, that cortisol is super high in their bloodstream and they don't respond to our vaccines very well. They can't fight disease very well. So anything we can do to get them into a starter section of the yard has been beneficial on the commercial feed yards that I work with. Let them rest before we vaccinate. And then again, that low stress cattle handling. As I talked about it, we always use um, you know, pressure and, and I think we overuse pressure. And it wasn't until I really appreciated that until we were in our fourth year at Iowa State, we had to work a pen of cattle, but we couldn't use a hot shot, we couldn't touch them, and we couldn't yell. And so that like took all three of the bullets out of my gun, because that's what I had when I, when I went to vet school. But we had to use pressure. And not only as a refresher for a ranch kid was it super good, but my classmate next to me from New Jersey was kind of like, oh, well, this is easy, and it was not intuitive to him at all. And taking that time to, to talk with our folks um, that are working cows and working calves um, about using pressure, and it's just little stuff that I find myself doing but not telling anybody what I'm doing. And so a little movement forward or back can absolutely make these calves move without a hot shot because... I'll go, to a pro I'll go work with a processing crew at a feed yard and every, cr or every critter on that feed yard gets a dose of five-way, a dose of seven-way, and a dose of electricity. And, and you want to talk about firing up cortisol levels. Somebody, when you teach them how to interact and move to get those cattle through without electricity, it's game changer for them. Then they think it's fun and then they're engaged and then it just kind of continues to, to, to pile on. So. Low stress to move our cows and calves is, is super important. I'm going to jump into managing parasites because I find that this one is kind of a fumble between the nutritionist and the veterinarian. And the one that I, that I often, I think we do a good job of our internal parasites, right? Our worms. I think we've got really good tools. I find coccidia to be a very impactful parasite um, on our health and morbidity and mortality. In our, in our starting feeder cattle. So there's a study that 99% of South Dakota cattle come out with, with coccidia in them as they come into the feed yard, as they're weaned. And so as, we, as I go work with backgrounding yards, paying special attention to coccidia has paid off in less respiratory treats, has paid off in less mortality from all causes as we've addressed that, that coccidia up front. The other thing that I guess I'll throw up there is I think there's a lot of people still today that think a, 
a back dose of ivamectoron is a good deworming strategy. Um, and and I, I think we've got to get to a point, all the studies have shown that, that our, that dose is so erratic and so um, not predictive of parasite kill that we need to get to a place where um, we're using injectable dewormers or a white dewormer. Have a deworming strategy for your farm. And there, there is not a one size fits all strategy. So working with our group of veterinarians or the FBN um, outside account execs or your local veterinarian, it's really something that we've got to dive into as producers to maintain these classes of wormers that we have today. Because if we think about, think about the effects of Roundup today, Roundup isn't as effective as it, as it once was, right? And so we've got a lot of Roundup resistance. The same thing, hap biology happens to all classes of things like that. And so managing parasites, um, not only we've got to have a specific strategy, but they reduce appetite. They reduce our calves' abilities to respond to our vaccines. They kill us in performance. And so we've got to have that right. But moving to a parasite project that addresses both, both internals and externals um, is super important. And the yards that I work with and talk to a lot of, the nutritionist and the veterinarian are sitting down managing coccidia because the veterinarian just goes, oh, the nutritionist has got ionophores in there. He's got, he's got that covered. And then when you start getting down to it and you start calculating some of the intakes of the ionophores, there, there's not enough intake for what he's got put in there. So having that and being very intentional with coccidia has paid off in both morbidity and mortality of, of uh, respiratory disease. You know, external, lice are a big problem in the upper Midwest for us. And life, lice has always been, been a challenge. Um, you know, they say they can cost us two-tenths of a pound of average daily gain. And there's no good data out there on feed conversion. Feed conversion pays the bills. So we've got to have a treatment that does both biting and sucking lice. So lots, I'm, I'm having a lot of my farms get their internal parasite protection from either a white dewormer or an injectable product. And we're using a lice specific product to control externals. I think as Ivamec, the brown box pioneer molecule became available in the, in the mid eighties, we've gotten super lazy at, at using that as our treatment. And they say, oh, and, we, and we're measuring the, the parasite control with the ability to control lice. And those two can't be conflated anymore. Internal, again, we got rounds, hooks, tapes, coccidia. We've got really good treatments, but they're very, we need to be very strategic with these compounds so that they can continue to, to work on our farms. Nutrition, this is uh, what I've been excited about is being a veterinarian with um, Farmers Business Network is now we've got a nutritionist that we can go to. Because traditionally, when the vet would roll up and talk about nutrition, it became a, a pointing contest of whose fault it was. And so having a focused and intentional teamwork approach to um, nutrition and health and seeing those both being absolutely interlocked has been excited. Because these calves, they have huge nutrition changes coming at them. If we want to put them on feed and push them into, you know, push them into an April, May market. And so up until the point that, that they've left your farm or have got to the feedlot, they've had milk, they've had grass, may or may not have had some creep. And this year it was 500 bucks a ton, right? So there, there was a lot of creep that was, may or may not have gotten used. And they've generally have had access to mineral, but nobody's really ever tracked uh, how much mineral consumption a baby calf would, would take in. But what I do find on postmortems oftentimes is as I get calves that are breaking with respiratory disease in the feed yard, I take a little mineral or a liver sample the size of a shooter marble and send it into the lab. Most of these calves are deficient in copper, selenium, zinc. Um, and so having, having some mineral out there that, that's also accessible to the calves or, 
or, or thinking about that. And, and a lot of times our feed yards, we're hedging our bets and put in a chelated mineral up front um, is super important because the tools that we've got, you know, on the, on the feedlot side are the concentrates, the distillers and silo feeds. These are substantially different, substantially wetter than what they had, had previously eaten. And they take some, some getting used to. So I let the nutritionist manage nutrition, but he knows that I'm open for input and I know that he's open for input on the health. And so having that teamwork approach on your farm, um, as well, you know, as, as cow nutrition, I'm finding a lot of ranches that are employing cow nutrition and we're actually working body condition scores back into our, our preg checking so that we can correlate body condition back to preg rates and then we can work with the nutritionist and find those key, key type or times a year, especially through the drought that we were just through, that we have opportunities to cost effectively change a, a body condition score on a cow. Again, the things that I think I find that are important with bringing calves either into a backgrounding situation or even, um, you know, bringing them onto a feed yard is bunk space. Um, feed yards in the central plains are bought and sold on nine inches of bunk space is kind of how they figure head, head capacity. And oftentimes these calves are going to need 12 to 24. I generally, we're generally going to settle on 12 to 13 inches of bunk space to get them to adequately come to the bunk, feel comfortable and, and actually start to take our ration in. So a lot of times we, we don't do enough evaluation of what we've got available as managers and producers on, on what our facility is really built for. And I've worked hard with a lot of my backgrounding yards to say, okay, this is a 206 head pen. Yep, you can flirt with 215 for a while, but to plan for 230 is unsustainable. And we use bunk space as a metric, we use water space, and then we use, you know, just absolutely, and then just pen space and laying space. So water space and refill rates, I think we found this in the hottest times of the year. Oftentimes we'll get a lot of dissatisfaction and you'll get cattle that are pacing. Um, and you go to the water and you'll find they're two and three deep just because our refill rates are, are tough. Slow, steady bumps of feed. I think uh, there's... Those are big deals. I think starting with a place of a percent and a half and working up from there um, of dry matter. And there's, there's times that we really have to te teach some of these tenants of the feed yard back to the ranch as we start to become backgrounders because the feedlots generally have the infrastructure, the personnel, the, the routine or the muscle memory, if you will, to get these calves fed on time, to get them fed consistently, and if we can't do that as ranchers or backgrounders, or we have, or we have a really safe diet of, you know, mostly, mostly hay, very limited concentrates, but we also have limited performance at that to make sure that we, we were as good on the, on the backgrounding as what the finishing guy is. Because lots of times in those first 40 days on feed, or the first 40 days we teach those calves to interact with us at the bunk, that behavior will trail with them all the way to finish. And so if we're not doing it right as backgrounders, we're really hamstringing our customer uh, later down the road or we can be. Slow changes in diet. Um, I think we've, we've proven that, that most of the intentional uh, diets that we put together make sense. I've got a few guys that are tweakers um, that mess with it. And then even distribution of feed. I was at a backgrounder in North Dakota here a few weeks ago and this dude missed 10 feet of bunk. And um, I said, I said, Randy, what happened here? And so 10 feet of bunk was probably about one and a half of these tables. And say, this is our bunk line. He says, oh, my cell phone went off and I took a call. But cattle eat within 10 feet of the same spot every day. And so these 10 calves didn't get fed that day. And so then they had to go fight Bubba, who usually sits on that end of the bunk, for what he had left over. And so those little bitty things, the even distribution of feed, and also being going back and looking at your bunk and seeing that the calves aren't sorting it is a, is a big deal. So managing nutrition, biosecurity, ranch versus sale barn calves, I think we've talked about some of that. 
Starting pins, I think they're, they're okay, um, but we got to have a pen built by, get a pen built by seven to 10 days. No, how many sources? You know, I would say a feedlot pin is somewhere from, depending on the yard, 120 to 200 head. Our average cow herd in the United States is like 39 head, 41 head, something like that. So if we had a 200 head pen and we said average cow herd's 40 head, you know, at minimum, we'd have five sources in there unless we bought a big string of something. So having our, and as well as keeping, keeping that thought process as we're, as we're packaging our groups of calves up to sell, right? What can I do? What can I offer to the sale barn? And what kind of package do I have that's more appealing to an order buyer or a feed yard? Previous immune status. I think the pre-weaning vaccination really has a dramatic impact on health, and we see that in our feedlot records. And that's what's interesting is we start to link the supply chain of beef that um, our record system on the feed yard generally is a tattletale on the amount of quality of management on the ranch. But on the flip side, if it's good, they're not going to tell you because they want to pay more for your calves, right? So having an open, honest dialogue with our, with our customers is a big deal. I clean waters every three days, and I have our, our farmers use bleach, especially in a commingled situation. Um, that residual bleach inside those waters will actually kill the haemophilus and, and pastorella pathogens in there. We don't add to pens after seven days, and we keep them in an isolated area of the yard. And I try to build off the previous immune status. Um, what, what can we do? How do we manage health and immunity at the feedlot? It's not too late to manage immunity, but we're, a lot of our bed is already made at that point when those calves come. And so as, as a feed yard veterinarian, you know, I, I try to build on our pre-weaning vaccinations, may or may not use internasals on arrival to help change our immune status, and plus or minus metaphylaxis. And so metaphylaxis is mass med on arrival. And, and what are our goals? Did we have a truck get stuck in a blizzard. Metaphylaxis makes a good sense. Did your order buyer not do the best job for you? And we've got some tail end cattle that have just infected these, this beautiful set of reds that you bought from Montana. Metaphylaxis may make some sense. And we, there is an immense amount of data that shows that if we can control that disease through metaphylaxis, that we can absolutely change the the feed conversion and average daily gain in those first 21 days at the feed yard. So metaphylaxis does pay in certain situations. Because when we get to the, the feed yard, my vaccine is in a race between exposure and protection. And so as we try to win the race on the health side, um, the exposure can really quickly outkick its coverage, especially if they're trailed for two days, sorted on for two days, and then sit at the cell barn for a day. I mean, we can be six days into it. And when we talk about an incubation that time, that far, it doesn't matter how much Draxin you've got, you can't get ahead of that. So in summary, um, these are the often look, overlooked details in a wean calf that I see. I'm, we're gonna be here for the rest of the show. I'm happy to talk about any or all of these that you see that may be opportunities on your farm to change. And I'll give you my best guess of what I've seen work, but Stress, parasites, nutrition, biosecurity, biocontainment, and it results in health and immunity. So if we can do those right, that it uh, makes a big difference. So I think that's my last slide. I'm happy to take some questions out here, comments, disagreements, any of the above. Ah, good question. What are, the question is, what I recommend for water space? The, the feedlot wisdom, wherever this came from, is, is, is one to two inches of linear water space. You know, you find most of your riches or, or waters um, are going to be rated per head or whatever your favorite water uh, is. Um, they're rated on a per head basis, and those generally aren't too far out of the norm. Make sure we've got enough flow rate in those waters to make sure that we can keep up with that. Because we've had, I've got a call to a feed yard that says, hey doc, we got a bunch of bullers going on. And I'm like, oh, all right, well, it must be an implant program, 
problem. Let me get on the phone to, to the animal health company and chew their butt for, for a little bit on the way out there. And so you get out there and they're bulling at the water because our refill rate is not fast enough. And so that behavior can start up. It looks like an implant or a buller problem, but it's a water problem. So controlling all those things make a big difference. Good question. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. And we, we're all short of labor. So, yep. you know, when metaphylaxis is 10, 20% of what the freight bill is on these cattle anymore, mm -hmm. do we worry about running into a... Um, effectiveness thing down the road or I mean a lot of us have gone to it uh, is there a concern running you know the effectiveness of that program is uh, yeah it so becomes your question is a common you know deal yep yep the the comment is is will medicine is metaphylaxis leading us down the road of maybe some resistant pathogens most of the data that I've seen on antibiotic resistance in different pathogens coming from the diagnostic lab and some of the studies I've seen would show that that resistance is fairly transient for 40 to 50 days. So if we use antibiotic A, we would not expect antibiotic A to be in our choice for a second or third pull, or even a first pull post metaphylaxis. So we will change classes um, after that. And, and so knowing the conversation, if you, if you have a backgrounding relationship, that your backgrounder hasn't used that same antibiotic for the previous 45 days, that would, that would make sense that where we would see some reduced efficacy on our yard um, if we're using the same one that he did. So if we can stay outside of that and we can continue to change antibiotic classes as we go from a first pull to a second pull to a third pull, post metaphylaxis, we generally, do, a lot of these cattle aren't around long enough to to create a mass resistance that's going to go back out into our cattle population. So, does that answer your question, Grant? Yeah. You know, I think uh, developing heifers, I think I'm a little more cautious on the use of metaphylaxis because I just want, I want those heifers to, to be heifers and get along. So, I, don't want, I want to make sure I don't bring something back in that I'm going to foster in my mama cow herd. Yes, sir? What's your bleach rate to water? It's super scientific. <clears throat> it's two glugs. <laughs> glug, glug. And the reason, and I, and I say that somewhat tongue in cheek, because if you can smell um, chlorine in the water, generally you've got a concentration in there of about 50 parts per million. And so the human nose smells about 50 parts per million. And so that's why two glugs get you about enough in there to, to, uh, smell it and get to that 50 parts per million. We had an intern one summer and that's what she did. Her internship for our clinic was cleaning waters and checking on pathogen kill and, and resistance. And generally, we, rather than a cup or two cups, a couple glugs of bleach is about a half a cup of bleach in a, in a richy water and that's enough to do it. So if you can smell it, generally I have them brush it with a, you know, scrub it with a brush and then pull the pin or drain it or leave it in there because 50, glo or 50 parts per million isn't enough to get in the rumen and, and kill the bugs in the rumen, but it is enough to kill the residual pathogens that are in the, in the, in the water. I generally do have people leave it in there, um, especially in Minnesota in the wintertime because you pull the pin, you pull the plug in one of those waters and all you've done is create an ice, an ice rink. And there's generally that rumen, that 50 gallons of a bacteria in there, it'd take a heck of a lot more bleach. You couldn't get enough bleach to kill the bugs in the rumen. Because I get a little pushback from nutritionists sometimes um, on that, and there's just not enough in there to kill, make a substantial kill in the rumen. Uh, we do it three times a week is what we try to do. We figure we get an extra day of residual, so you get it on the kill day plus another day. So that's three days a week. We should cover our week. Yes, sir? So do you use the bleach even if you're on a chlorinated uh, rural water type source? No, the bleach isn't important on a, on a rural water system. There's enough, there's, you know, usually five to 10 parts per million in rural water uh, of bleach. And that, that constant bathing of that is probably enough to have the same effect.
No, see, the other one is lick tubs. That's the other place where you get calves that'll swap, swap spit um, and essentially can be a nidus of infection. I say if they're covered with more than half boogers, get them out of the pen. Other than that, they're a good place for a calf that doesn't know what a bunk is to go at least get some salivation going so that we can, uh, so we get some salivation going so we get some buffer and don't get into an acidotic situation. Generally, no, I'm not, I'm not looking for nutrition out of there. I'm looking for behavior. It's kind of it's like the uh, sucking their thumb for a little bit, especially on these calves. But just keeping that buffer going is what I, I generally find. Awesome. Yes, sir. Yep. Yep. You can generally do that. You know, we had a, our, 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 how, our personal house well, uh, we, had to, we had to bleach it just, and it took like a, a whole gallon would do, I mean, an immense amount of water. And so. Um, I would just, just because some of that, as soon as that bleach comes in contact with organic material, which is what we can't control down in the well, it becomes inactive. And so can you smell it? If you bleach the well, can you smell it at the, at the cattle water? Then, then I would be doing the, the troughs in addition to it. Cause if you can't physically smell it, you don't have 50 parts per million. Yep.